Hello, puppies and kittens. Uh, it, it, when we're arguing with the believers uh, on the existence of God, and I find that n none of the questions really are are relevant on on the issues of uh, like uh, evolution or even flat Earth. I mean, it, people will let go of any number of things and just clinging to the idea of God. But there's one concept that will cause them to even let go of God, because when they believe in God, what they're really believing in is not the magic imaginary friend. It's really they're envisioning themselves as God. And the reason that I say this is I, I, I caught a video by a preacher who, who put me in a movie of his. So it was of my week in atheism, wherein I caught him giving a lecture to his uh, sermon to his own congregation, wherein he admitted that if he couldn't live for absolutely forever, then he saw no value in human life. He saw no value in other people's lives. He says if, he, if what he does today doesn't still matter, and he doesn't still matter five billion years from now, then nothing matters now. He said there's no reason to prolong life, but there's no reason to minimize suffering. He was the most nihilistic person I've ever encountered. And I mean nihilistic in the negative way, not the way that nihilists would refer to themselves. So we're going to be discussing the one thing that makes God go away is when you realize that there's no support for the soul because everybody's belief in God is actually dependent on a belief in themselves being God's, their, in their own ability to survive death and continue on in the, some unkillable way. So Dr. Chris Thompson uh, you are one of several neuroscientists that I have talked to about this subject, or we've we've talked in private, and some others have given me a number of extensive notes to put in some of my videos. But I've always wanted to have a recorded chat with a neuroscience on the topic of mind-body dualism and the and uh, what could be considered, you know, what what some people will claim as evidence for the soul or evidence against the soul or the dearth of evidence where there should be, however you would put that. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would also so, appreciate it if you would describe uh, your, your accolades a little bit to get us started in the audience. Thanks. So I'm uh, an assistant professor at the School of Neuroscience in Virginia Tech, and I've been here for about six years. My research isn't on like consciousness per se. My research actually focuses more on neurotoxicology and neuroendocrinology, but um, I have a pretty wide extensive knowledge of how the brain works. And um, the other thing, though, is I want to just briefly mention how we came into you know, contact with each other. We also, ha I have a great appreciation for evolutionary biology and comparative biology, as do you. So we ended up debating together uh, on modern day debates um, on the issue of creation and evolution. I've actually done a few other debates on my own channel. I have a, my own YouTube channel. Um, and I also do videos on neuroscience, topics of neuroscience. Um, debating creationists, um, also debating on this issue, mind-body dualism. And uh, I remembered our conversation before and I had reached out and I said, hey, you know, it'd be great to revisit this, to talk about it. Um, this isn't like my research per se, but I know the thing is like most neuroscientists don't even really consider this to be an issue because it's moot. It's, it's really silly. The brain is incredibly mechanistic and uh, we have great explanations for virtually every potential mind function or conscious function from a biological neuroscience based perspective. And um, it's basically at this point, we're getting down to the, I mean, so there's the idea of the God of the gaps argument. This is really a ghost of the gaps argument. There, the, the little window in which you can insert a spirit or woo or something into the brain to make it do something just gets smaller and smaller and smaller with every little detail that we learn about the brain. There just isn't room for it. So yeah, happy to talk about like where it kind of comes from and the background on this and why it's a silly idea, you know? So yeah, where do you want to, where do you want to start, Aaron? What do you think? There's a lot to talk about with this topic, but. Let's, let's start rolling down the runway rather slowly sure. before we get up to, yeah. to flight speed. Uh, I remember much to my embarrassment now, I mean, I had a common belief that I know, I know several adults that still believe this today, uh, that, that life had to be animated by a sort of life force. Now, this is George Stahl's theory that was disproved in the, in the 19th century, yet most of the adults that I met in my youth, that, you know, growing up, certainly, actually believed this. 
that life had to be animated by some kind of a supernatural spirit, that you had the 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 corporeal body and then you had the spiritual body that brought it to life. And then when when the, when it dies, you know, the, the body returns to dust and the spirit returns to the spirit world or that kind of thing. And then taking advanced biology classes, you know, for science majors, when you, when you get into the real nitty gritty about how, you know, the, the, the electron changes is to how neurons operate. I mean, just when you get into the specifics, you realize that not only is there no room for any of that, there's utterly no need for it. No. That, that no. life is a Whatsoever. just is extremely complex chemistry. Right. And there, yeah. there is no spirit behind it. Right. And, you know, to be fair, you can appreciate where philosophy and even theologians started with this premise. Like, you can kind of understand that it does appear to be mysterious <laughs> and almost magical that there is a mind. And when you look at the brain, I mean, you can think back to even how the Egyptians used the brain when they mummified, um, you know, people, they discarded the brain. It was completely useless to them. They thought the heart and the other organs, the liver, those were the important things. The brain was just pulled out through the nose with a silver uh, hook and discarded completely. So when you think back to like what Descartes, you know, Descartes is really kind of the most modern formulation who really laid out the main mind body dualism issue um you can appreciate where he was coming from like where do we explain how can we explain human behavior and at that time it was a mystery and i get that now the thing is about the way descartes approached this he was using his very methodical process of going through a series of logical steps to trying to understand behavior and he arrived at the idea, basically, you know, starting with nothing. I know nothing. So what do I do know? Well, I know that I think, and I think, therefore, I am. Cogito erto sum comes from Descartes, right? So we have that as a, like an, an initial starting point for where this comes from. So then he got into the issue of like, well, I know I have a body, but I also know that I can think. So, but do I know I have a body? So you had to go through all of this. And yes, he came to the conclusion that he does have a body. Great. I'm glad that he came to that conclusion. And that meant that there's some sort of interaction. There has to be an interaction point between the mind, which he considered to be non-physical and immaterial, and the body. And, you know, he was a man of, like, observation and drawing conclusions. He knew some information about how the brain is structured. He knew that the brain had to be involved in this some way. And do you do you know what he decided was that interaction point in the brain? It's been a long time since That's I've read fine. Descartes, and I'm and, and I'm just re I'm just remembering that I need to reread it for a reason I'm going to bring right. up in just a moment. But go ahead, what, what are you going to so say? It's the pineal gland, and do you know what the pineal gland does? <laughs> it's the part of the endocrine system. I yes. Mean, I, yeah. It synthesizes melatonin, and um, yeah. Yeah, right. So that's what we know of it. But the reason why he which decided, is a pretty accurate guess, all things sure. considered. And actually, in some ways, you can understand his logic. So part of his logic yeah. is that you know the brain is largely bilateral symmetrical, as is the rest of our body. And of course, the brain has that reflection too. And so he knew that, like, okay, well, it can't just be on one side or the other side. Most things are like duplicated. There's one left side and a right side. But the pineal gland, there is just one of them, and it sits right in the center of the brain. Now, it's an incredibly tiny little pea-like structure. It's really, really tiny. But he felt that this had to be, since there's only one, there had to be this. This is the intersection point that then talks to the rest of the brain. And this was the spirit uh, entry point into how it can affect how the brain works, which then can cause how the rest of the body works and cause behavior. So it's fair that he came up with that idea. It's completely wrong because it's simply just involved in the regulation of uh, our sleep cycles. Um, and yeah, right. So, um, and we know that it, so at least he took the effort to try to think about this issue that there has to be some kind of interaction. But then when you go down this pathway, well, where is it? Where does it come in? And it, there's just no way to explain it. As you said, like neurons, they fire, they involve not necessarily electrons per se, as you put it, but like change exchanges of ions across membranes and you have channels that open. 
one neuron has to talk to I another I was thinking neuron. ATP at some point. Yeah, sure. No, there's an electron transport chain. Exactly. And that's also critical for how neurons work as well, right? So all of it is incredibly mechanical and chemical. And we can describe the function of how neurons and add the activity of neurons, how it is directly related to and corresponds and ultimately controls behavior in animals and in humans. And there just isn't place for a ghost or a spirit to get in there and do the control for this. It's just, it's mind boggling to me that there are people who really do take it seriously. But as you said, this is a core belief of so many of the believers that they just kind of take it for granted. And it largely just comes from ignorance that they just don't understand how the brain works. And therefore it's just assumed that, well, you know, people don't really know. I, I mean, there's a lot of ignorance about the brain, right? Like that the 10% brain myth is a thing. And I even have students ask me if that's a real thing. So, and these are neuroscience students. Yeah, that, that's, that's another story for mine. I mean, yeah. when, when somebody mentioned that, that we, the, the part of the brain that we use for our higher order thinking skills was the gray matter, and that constitutes 10% of our the mass of the brain. I'm like, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's where that came from. Sure. <laughs> and even that isn't exactly right, because it's not, it's more than 10%. The, the, the gray matter portions of the brain, and that, so for gray matter, for those who don't know, those are the areas of the brain where you have the cell bodies of neurons. And we, we were, that's in contrast to white matter, which is the axons that are connected from one brain area to another. And I mean, that's it. The neuron, the whole brain is made up of just gray matter and white matter. It's neurons sitting in certain places, and then they are connected to other neurons in other places. And the sum activity of neurons is what manifests as behavior. And the important the point being, the important point being that we use our entire brain, you know, yes. for bodily functions Absolutely. and for regulation and for other things. Right. It's only we use that 10 percent. And I realize it's not an exact quote, but it, what we often hear is the 10 percent was only what we use for the higher order thinking. And so somebody distorts that into 90 percent of our brain is sitting there unused. Right. Yes. And when I when I read through when I when I started uh, talking about, you know, like in the intro, as soon as I mentioned that, you know, that, that some people would take, you know, would even throw out God if they can't have a soul. I mean, that really all of it depends on on them believing they have an immortal soul. I realized right away Descartes, oddly enough, because you brought him up a moment mm -hmm. later, he was kind of an exception to that because while he is famous for having said, I think, therefore I am, I find it strange that he was made famous for that, but he contradicted himself mm -hmm. later in the same work. Yes. Where he where he concludes that God exists, but he he doesn't necessarily exist. Maybe he doesn't exist, and God does. Right. Yes, and and I think if you and you may correct me on this if I don't uh, have this right, but I believe Descartes' argument for the existence of God is that because Descartes can conceive of an entity like God, that must mean that God exists, and. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because I can conceive of all kinds of weird things, that, but that doesn't mean that they exist. Like we need evidence that these things exist. Um, yep, that, indeed. Yes. <laughs> so then, then another thing that come up. And a matter of fact, I saw I saw a tweet from Lawrence Krauss about this today. Mm -hmm. Now he's a cosmologist. Why would he be commenting on on neuroscience? But mm -hmm. it was a tweet just a, an hour or two ago that I saw mm -hmm. from him talking about the hard problem. Oh yes, the hard. And I've problem. I've had it. I had an interview with uh, um, um, Patricia Churchland mm -hmm. on this very issue, and David Chalmers, the guy who came up with you know the hard problem. Yeah. And the sad thing was, is that I, what I saw immediately was that Chalmers is giving a, he, he's giving a, a false dichotomy fallacy for his that that's the the entire thing that all these philosophers are so dependent on this hard problem is his his giving a false dichotomy fallacy. That's what the whole thing's based exactly. on. He, his his hypothesis was that you you have no consciousness you build up all these neurons you have no consciousness and then you build up what you know five billion two hundred and seventh neuron and now you have full consciousness Suddenly consciousness of course not mm -hmm. the the simplest a single neuron has some capacity for intellect and as a matter of fact even when even single celled organisms that are not neurons right have demonstrated some capacity of comprehension of their surroundings, of understanding fight or flight mode, memory, memory. Yeah, yes. the calculations of a type. I mean, there's there's sure. a 
fucking slime mold can do right. that. So right. <laughs> Eric Kendall, who got the Nobel Prize for his work on memory, he worked out the mechanisms of memory. Um, it wasn't just him. There were other scientists contributing too, of course. But his work was done in the the um, the sea slug, the plesia. And so they have an incredibly simple nervous system. Part of the reason why I could do this and, and kind of identify the underlying molecular and neural mechanisms of how memory works is because they have a relatively simple nervous system, but they can learn. They can, they can, they have memory that can be in, you know, an engram exists. And so that's a neuroscience term for the physical representation of a memory. And, uh, and, and we know like how that works. Do we have all the details in place? No, but those gaps are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think that that's where like people who really do sort of want to wrestle from the other side of this, that there really is this sort of ethereal mind or spirit, those gaps, they're having to cram them into tiny and tinier little places. And it's, it's simply an argument of ignorance is really what it comes down to it. So what, so what I see, and as I said, I'm a little, I'm a little surprised that lowly myself would, would hear David Chalmers give the explanation for his thing. Yeah. And I realized the fundamental failure in it. Mm -hmm. And then just to verify that, that I guessed this correctly, I had, I then have to go talk to other philosophers and other the neuroscientists, you know, Patricia Churchland right. is in neuro neurosciences as well. And she says, yeah, here's the problem. You've got this guy who's describing how much pressure ultimately does it take to flip the switch from off to on when that's not what we're dealing with. We are yeah. dealing with a dial Absolutely. that turns up. So Radiation. how much consciousness do you have? If you have exactly. a single cell, a single cell organism can tell a paramecium suddenly realizes that it's been enveloped by an amoeba and now it's in panic mode. Well, how right. could it be if it had no awareness, if it had no mm -hmm. consciousness at all, right. doesn't have a brain, doesn't have neuron one, but it's aware of this. Yes. And so when you have a mass of these things, of course, you're going to get, I, I'm, I'm somebody who understands, you know, emergent aspects you know emergent right. patterns right. and of course the, the people i'm arguing with don't understand that because i've got an upside down worldview wherein instead of being emergent from the bottom up they have to have everything orchestrated from the top down that's right yeah they have no appreciation for the fact of emergence or epiphenomenon that can come from the you know extraordinary complexity that can arise from this sort of seemingly random process of uh, of how like neurons get wired up and get connected and um, right. There's, there's no appreciation for emergence. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's so clear that that's the case because one, we can uh, damage brain areas, right? That's the easiest, simplest experiment that anyone can do is if A causes B, if we destroy A, do we ever see B? And if you destroy A, so if you just damage a part of the brain and sometimes this accidentally happens in humans from stroke or from, injuries you know one of the most famous cases is phineas gage a damage to a certain part of the brain ultimately results in specific deficits having to do with whatever function that that part of the brain is involved with and then of course there's observational work right so you can the 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 thing that maybe has changed this story the most over the last 30 to 40 years is the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging so we can put people into brain scanners and we can observe what their brains are doing at any given moment when they are doing some sort of task. And there is not a single emotion or some sort of mental state that we cannot describe from what kind of activities we see in the brain. That doesn't mean we understand it all in, in all its finest detail, but you cannot find a single emotion or some sort of conscious state or something that, that some kind of mental activity that isn't correlated and isn't even controlled through like distinct action within the brain. Like it just doesn't exist. And it's so like, what are we left with at this point, right? Like if you're eliminating emotions like happiness and sadness and anger, if you're eliminating the thoughts that we have, we know what areas of the brain are involved with that. If you're eliminating the awareness, as you said, right? So the sensory perception, our focus, we have attentional areas. We can see distinct activity in brain areas that then all of a sudden will be that will proceed even decision making like before an animal or even a human does something there's certain areas of the brain that might be activated depending upon the task that they're doing so this is even before so like this is it's it's a clearly an emergent property that's from the activity of neural ne networks and um yeah i it's it's no. almost 
like no neuroscientist ever thinks about this issue. I mean, like we talk about the brain a, a ton. We love talking about the brain. It's a fascinating organ to, to, to work on and to think about because there's so much that we really don't know. But we all think of it as what is it doing from a mechanical perspective? We don't leave room for magic and woo. I mean, that's what, really what it is. That's what the mind-body dualism argument is. On that note, uh, you, you, in, the, in the movie Frozen, the, mm -hmm. the, the girl discovers her magic powers. We're just talking about magic. So yeah. she, she like with a flick of her hand, whips into existence a snowman. Snowman, yes. And then she meets the snowman later in the movie, and she goes, are you alive? Hmm. And I love the snowman's answer is, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's brilliant. I love that answer. Yeah. And it, it leads me to a hypothetical question based on yeah. the topic that we're, we're talking about right. now. Um, can... An a, 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 any form I don't uh, of artificial intelligence or or maybe right. not necessarily intelligence, but uh, it, is any if you had a, a device that has a number of means of of uh, mm -hmm. detecting its its environment, right? So it's it's got cameras, it's got microphones, it's got you know sensors of all of various types. It can tell sure. its balance. Uh, it can tell its internal te temperatures and pressures and all of that, just like we do, you know, because everybody thinks about, you know, we have, you know, five senses or so. They don't realize how many we actually have. It's a yes. whole lot more it's than that. More. But if you were to equip a device, even not necessarily an intelligent device, although, although the last aspect you would need intelligence for just for the experiment, would it be possible for an automated thing like this to think that it's conscious, even if we don't accept what it what it perceives as consciousness. I, I see no reason why not. Um, I you know, and, and all the hullabaloo over artificial intelligence the last several months, it kind of you you know, it makes it clear that we're getting close to this issue, and it's going to come about at some point. That, like, there's already a debate about whether some of these language learning models are truly like independent intelligence and or consciousness some degree or not. I don't think that that's necessarily the case yet, but I the part that you were talking about as far as adding the sensory input portion, I think that's one of the most truly most fascinating parts of this because that that really is the thing that, that uh, organisms such as ourselves and other organisms that appear to have at least some level of consciousness all share, right? Uh, that you have to be able to integrate that information that exists in the world sense it, process it, and then act upon it. But all of that thing, all that stuff that I'm talking about is just a series of steps that can be replicated in non-biological material. It really could. Absolutely. I don't think that there's any reason why it couldn't. Um, it'll be fascinating. I'm really excited to see what the next several years are going to be like, because um, this debate is going to get bigger. And I think that the artificial intelligence development is going to really challenge and bring this whole mind-body dualism debate to the forefront of a lot of conversations. Like when people start being convinced that, okay, these things really do seem like intelligent entities that we need to have some sort of level of respect for, or like that we need to consider that they have a consciousness, like we, that's going to call into question, well, what does it mean for us as humans? And a lot more people start thinking about it because not to say that like, you know, like it's for me, it's not a problem that my thoughts and my feelings are the result of the activity of neural networks. I'm OK with that. But I think most people don't get that. They think that there's something special beyond that. And it's going to be like kind of a shattering thing. I mean, on the order of Darwin and Scopes Monkey Trial, like I really do think that neuroscience could be like the next sort of evolutionary biology. We shouldn't be teaching this in schools kind of thing because of this issue. I, I do think that there's a chance of that happening. And I'm excited if it happens because that'll mean lots of debates for me. So, <laughs> Yeah, the, the invention of the automobile has somewhat confused this philosophically for a number of people, I mm -hmm. think, because people imagine you know you you buy the the fancy car because you want to be the fancy car you want to show up in the beautiful car because it's easier to buy that than than to be the beautiful being you know be the beautiful being yourself right mm -hmm. and so people think that uh, when the car is wrecked you can get out of that and go get into another vehicle and you're still you 
but you're now in that new vehicle. And, and it re reminds me of another movie, The Men in Black, the, the first one, mm -hmm. where you know the, the mortician is, uh, is is peeling apart the layers of this this body, and, and she sees that the body is not actually a body, it's just a vehicle, and there's a tiny little man inside the head with a bunch of levers and everything. Mm -hmm. And so this is what the believers that I'm talking to seem to believe something like that, except that it's yeah. not a physical guy right. trapped in there. It's literally a ghost in the machine. Exactly. Literally a ghost in the machine. Yes. And that's really at the, at the core of what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, the, 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 the lack of evidence for the ghost, you mentioned Phineas Gage. There's a whole yeah. a number of other things. Where is the ghost? Why, why does the ghost have no effect right. in certain situations? How is the ghost itself unaffected by other by other situations? Where is it? There can't be a correlation here. Right. I know you know where I'm going with this, and I just I just want to set the stage for you to take mm -hmm. over. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, Phineas Gage is a great example. So for those of us those out there that don't know about Phineas Gage, he was a railroad railroad worker who uh, was tapping some dynamite into a tube. Um, you you know, tapping it down with like a pole. And then when the pole, um, unfortunately, the dynamite went off too early and the pole went through his head, went through here, stuck through his head and completely out the other side. And there's still some debate about whether it was like one hemisphere or both hemispheres that were affected. But mostly it damaged his frontal and prefrontal cortices. Now, the frontal and prefrontal cortices, they're most interesting because of the fact that they're involved with so much of the. I don't know, I guess more mysterious parts of what the brain does, emotion, logic, reasoning. And when it damaged these areas in his, um, um, of his brain, immediately afterwards, it was like his personality was completely different. He basically didn't suffer much other problems. Like his vision was still fine. His hearing was mostly okay. Uh, he could still walk and talk and move around, but his personality was severely disrupted. And so like another aspect of this that a lot of people may not know. So I think I know I think a lot of people know about Phineas Gage, but one really fascinating kind of stroke is stroke that results in damage of an area of the brain called Wernicke's area. So Wernicke was a German scientist who was working with stroke victims and he was looking at what areas of the brain are damaged and affected and what do they correlate with behavior. And people were working on this for over 100 years, right? So he was doing this, and he identified an area of the brain that's located at the junction of the parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. Um, I've got a whole video on my channel that describes uh, this. It's, it's a language video that's part of my neuroscience series. Um, and there's a great video in there of a guy who had damage to this area of his brain. Now, people who have damage to Wernicke's area, this is a language area. We refer to it as a language area. And the thing that's super interesting about this guy is that he has a condition known as fluent aphasia. And what aphasia means is that you have problems with speaking, but he can speak. That's why it's fluent. But the words that are coming out of his mouth are completely meaningless. And it's almost like he's sequencing the word, the order of the words, but none of it means anything. And the thing that's so tragic about these individuals who have like damage to Wernicke's area is that they kind of lose sense of who they are and they lose sense of like even talking with other people. Um, there's a really great YouTube video of, uh, of this. I'll share this link with you of, of a patient who's suffering from Wernicke's uh, aphasia. And it's fascinating. And it's so clear that like damage to this particular part of the brain, it's basically erased his mind, if anything, right? It shows like a specific deficit where now there is a complete loss of any sort of true conscious understanding. Like he's, and it's sad, right? Because like, this is a person. And he's suffering from this condition. And the thing that's so sad about it is like, he's just kind of gone, even though he can walk and talk and move stuff. But all the words coming out of his mouth are completely meaningless. Like, it's just total garbly goat. They call it word salad. So like, okay, so we can go through over and over and over again of what damage to certain areas of parts of the brain and what it results in as far as the human condition and changes in behavior or sensory deficits at all of the brain has this specificity, but there are certain parts where it's so obvious that clearly something has happened to what you might call a mind if you just damage this area of the brain. Like, and that, like, that does not mean that there's some sort of spirit acting in there. We also know that this area of the brain is highly interconnected with other language centers. And so we know how all of that works, right? So, 
Um, for instance, and I'm kind of going on here a little bit, but the you told me to go on, so I am. Um, so Wernicke's area also talks to another area called Broca's area, which was defined by another scientist named Broca. And so people who have damage in this area, they have um, an aphasia where they cannot find the word. So their ability to string words together is completely compromised, but at least they have comprehension. If, they, if someone talks to them, they can understand it, but they can't put the words together in order to speak. And it's clearly like all of this interaction of these different subsystems is absolutely necessary for us to have dialogue, for me to be able to understand, for me to have that internal dialogue in my head of what I'm going to say and what you were saying, but also for me to be able to put the words together to control my vocal box, my lungs, so that I can create the phonemes and string them in a way so that it comes out as semi-comprehensible English, which I hope people are understanding, right? And that's and the changing in my tongue and the intonation, all of this, we know these areas. So it's like, where does the ghost fit in in that, right? Where does the ghost go to do that? And why is it if we break certain parts that it seems to result in very specific deficits in our ability to do these things? A, a friend of mine, one of my one of my best friends, you know, you, you only have in your, your life a very small handful of best friends. And yep. uh, he was one of my top three uh, but he he suddenly suffered a series of strokes. He had he mm -hmm. had like a bunch of strokes at once, or not at once, but in Which a short yes. yeah in in a short period of time he had a bunch of strokes. And I remember when I was studying Russian, there was a time when I could piece together sentences in Russian, but I would have to sit here and think about the word. To, what is the word that means this? Take that, and and I would have to assemble it in my mind. And I was seeing him have to do that with English. Yep. You know, the only language he's ever spoken, but he's having to remember the word that means right. this. Mm -hmm. And he's having to do the same thing. Yes. Uh, and with numbers, it was even weirder. He couldn't say numbers. He'd have to write them. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. He would have to write, write it and say this number. And I, sure. and I would say, oh, 10,000. He goes, yes. How, okay. Well, beyond me. It. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. And, and those. So how is the, how is the ghost? in there not capable mm -hmm. of getting past so that one analogy i've heard <laughs> is that they they say that the 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 brain is a piano and that there's a piano player that has to play on a piano and if the piano is damaged well now the piano player can't actually play the piano i'm sorry that analogy breaks down too there has to be a piano player touches on the keys and makes them depress and 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 to allow for noise to happen to make music there is an interaction. You have to show an interaction if you're going to assume that those that, that that is a thing. That if that actually exists, you can't just assume it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's so a, we we we've if there was this ghost, if there was uh, mm -hmm. if your personality or however right. other people want to describe your mind sure. or whatever this this version of self well, is. Actually, that's a great issue already because as far as neuroscientists go we don't really talk about mind per se even though that's sort of what it is mind is really the sum total of a bunch of things that we talk about um attention abilities consciousness personality emotion processing memory like all of these basic functions i suppose you might call mind but that's the thing like we can those are now when we break it down into like subcategories well, we can start talking about the specific areas of the brain that are involved with this, right? So, but anyway, sorry, I interrupted. Here's, here's where I want to go with this. Uh, there's two concepts I'm going to present at the same time. One uh, is the idea that, uh, that, you can, that one body breaks down and whatever the you is, whatever you want to call it, whether it's mind or personality, some, you know, qualia or whatever right. collection, whatever yourself is, right. somehow leaves that body to go inhabit another body. And the second scenario is uh, where people always say that, you know, well, if I knew then what I know now, okay, here's the idea. Uh, if you were going to trans, if you had some means of time travel and now you just need the means to, to transport your mind into your younger self, mm -hmm. either case, it's not possible because Everything you learn, and like I said, when I was learning Russian, well, I have all of these synapses now built up for this, and now I can I can readily access this. But then, if you fall out of practice at that, well, then all of that deteriorates, and you get something else practiced, right? Okay. 
So you, you study martial arts, you get muscle memory. And so if it, if it were possible to take your mind out of somebody else and put them, put, put your mind into that of a martial artist, well, suddenly you're going to have that muscle memory skill because you have the synapses in the physical brain, but the things that you were practiced in knowing all of your musical skill or whatever it is, is gone. Mm -hmm. And you just don't have that anymore because it's all comes down to that, that network of synapses yes. that, that require physical building. That's Likewise, right. if you want to go back to your younger self, if I only knew all that I knew now, mm -hmm. good luck putting that back into your, what, you know, 18 year old self. Yes. Because so, at the yes. very, it, it, you can't do the Neo thing where you plug the no, thing in the back and says, I know Kung Fu. There's, it takes but, time to build those. <laughs> it takes time to build. But even worse <laughs> is that every brain is different. And I don't mean that they're just different that, at the level of the synapses that you're talking about, because that's true. But the precise location of these specific areas that we're talking about, when you look at a map of the brain, we have, you know, a somatosensory cortex is adjacent to motor cortex. And then you've got visual cortex. Those are, sure, sure those are general regions that we have. But the details actually vary a fair amount from brain to brain. And so going back to Vernicki's area and Broca's area, as well as a number of other language centers that, we were, that I mentioned, those locations are not universal across all humans. It varies precisely where it's located. So you wouldn't be able to take like the synapses from, say, like the exact synaptic conformation of the millions and millions literally billions of neurons and the, even more connections uh, for that and then transpose it onto another brain because it's not going to be exactly the same. And the an 18-year-old brain is very different than a 30-year-old brain and it's very, very different from a 65-year-old brain. The brain changes slowly over time. And I hate to say this, but unfortunately for old cadres like you and me, it just gets worse. Uh, I mean, you may have noticed, like you're probably... You're a very, very sharp guy, but I'm sure you were sharper when you were 25 than you are now. And that's certainly true for me, too. Um, it's just it's a it's the nature that degeneration occurs. Right. And I, I, well, it, it depends on how you define sharp. <laughs> I was I was sharp. Yeah. In all the wrong ways. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I I would love to hear some of those stories. Maybe sometime I'll come down to Texas. We can talk about that. <laughs> but the um, yeah, and I certainly did some dumb things too at that time. But uh, but you know, you know what I mean. The whip smart. You know, sometimes you find yourself. What did I do? Did I did I leave the garage door open? I don't remember if I closed it or not. I, those thoughts would never even occur to me as a younger man. But I find myself thinking that often now. So. But there's that, been one or two times uh -huh. I've left these doors behind me that you see. Oh, yeah. I've left one of them open. Yeah. And then come back in the room. And, oh, holy fuck. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine what's in there. There's a reason why they're in cages. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, they're all your babies. I'm sure you're just worried that like, are they in there? Are they okay? So, yeah. Yeah. So that's hilarious. Um, so let's see. Yeah, and honey, did you where, where have was. you seen the cat since this morning? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Why is that snake so fat? <laughs> exactly. Um, so we were talking about how we we don't evidently oh, have yes. a, a and, ghost. And I was talking about and and, and it can't time. go from yes. one vehicle to another, even yes. if it could, even it if there was not. a thing that could. Yes. If if we were computers, because that's another common analogy. Sure. I can I can copy all the data mm -hmm. from my hard drive and I can plug it into a different hard drive, but because it's in a different computer, all the hardware is different and now it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I mean, so that's there's right. only certain data that can be copied. exactly. Yes. It's and that's actually a great analogy. Um, you can't just copy an entire operating system from one computer put it into a different computer that has slightly different hardware and expect it to work. It just isn't going to work. It's and, and actually, it's a really great analogy because part of what sets up personality and emotion and processing is development. 
And you have to go through that development, the, the going to karate class and learning karate or go, taking music lessons or learning a language, for instance. Actually, language is a great example because what happens is that the brain has certain critical periods that are built into place. So, for instance, with language, we know that around the age of eight to 10 years old, that critical period starts to, to close. So if you were learning, a, say, a second language, it's so much better if you are exposed to that language prior to when that critical period starts to close, that's starting at around eight, age eight or 10. And if you try to do it now, like you did with Russian, you're having to think about it, you're trying to have to piece it together. And we know, because we can scan brains for people who learned a, a second language as an adult versus someone who learned a second language as a child. And if they learned it as an adult, it's generally the logic areas of the brain that get activated when they're like thinking or doing certain language-based tasks in that second language. But if they learned it as a child, it is the language centers that are primarily activated and they don't have to use like the logic and reasoning areas of the brain. And it's because, you know, well, certainly with Russian, but really any second language, you got to sit there. And if you learned it as an adult, we don't know the rules. We, and when I say no, like that means they were not entrained in those language centers during that critical period. And it is closed and you can't really change them past that critical period. But you can still learn. You just have to use higher order processing in order to do it, which is going to be memory and logic processing areas and, and reasoning areas that are involved. And, and, and we see it like you can just put someone into a scanner and look at this. I, I mean, it's just it's so plainly obvious. Um, and the other thing about language, and I like to emphasize language because I actually think one way to kind of tie it back to the artificial intelligence part is that I think language is actually the, co the core of why human consciousness does appear to be so special as far as animals are concerned, right? So- uh, Yeah, and this brings up a good point that I wanna raise too. Yes, Go ahead. okay. So I really do think that our language capabilities is really our most distinguishing feature. There are animals, of course, that can communicate. I'm, an, I'm a, a neuroscientist who has studied uh, animal communication from the neuroscientist's perspective. I worked uh, with songbirds, on how they do vocalizations and how the brain circuits that control vocalizations have done this in songbirds. Um, and it's super fascinating work. Uh, that's a parrot that you're looking at. And there are only three birds that we know learn their vocalizations, three groups of birds. There are songbirds, there are parrots, of course. And do you know the third one? Corvids? Corvids are actually uh, a, a kind of songbird. So are they? Yes, I believe I that's have, right. I might have that wrong, but I'm pretty sure the corvids are part of the passerine family. Um, I might have that wrong. Let me double check. Uh, well, yeah, they. I, th I think they are passerine. Yes. So passerines are the songbirds. Yes. Yeah. So not not the subossine passerines. So they don't they don't learn their vocalizations as far as we can tell. That includes things like barn swallows and and the other swallows and the swifts. Um, but they do kind of sing. There's some debate whether they learn it or not. The the third group is hummingbirds. Believe it or not. So if you've ever heard a hummingbird, you know, hummingbirds are amazing little creatures. They And I'm getting a little off track here, but I love birds. So we're going to talk about it a little bit. Hummingbirds are so amazing. They they swoop around and they're constantly fighting each other and they can get really pissed off. And they are so fascinating to watch. But they one thing that they will do, they're highly territorial, territorial and they will go up and like perch way high up in a tree. And then you'll hear this tiny little squeaky noise. Sometimes if you're just out and if the hummingbirds are out, if you just listen, you hear this little, little tiny squeak. That is the high pitched, it's around 20 kilohertz um, song of a, hum of a hummingbird. And it's learned. And if you listen to it, you'll hear that it's a repeated sequence of notes. And they're doing that because they're advertising. The male is saying like, yo, ladies, come on. Or saying to the other mm -hmm. males like, F off, this is my territory right? How you um, doing? Yeah, exactly. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so um, where was I going with that? All right. So we we're talking about language. Yes. And so um, that's not language though, right? That is, that is something that's special for communication that animals need to do, which is to reproduce and defend territories, that kind of thing. But humans, the, the capacity for us to have language is well beyond what other animals are capable of. And I think that it's actually core to consciousness because when you sit and think it is words that you are thinking and processing when you and you will have a dialogue in your brain 
And we know what areas of the brain that are involved with this. And it does involve language centers. It's not just language centers, but there's this amazing set of uh, circuits that we now call the default mode network. And this area, of the these areas of the brain are highly interconnected. They happen to be the most um, energy intensive areas of the brain. So that means they use the most like glucose um, uh, in, in the brain. And then they're called the default mode network because if you put a patient or a, a subject into a scanner and you tell that patient, look, just don't think of anything, right? Don't think of anything, okay? We're, we gotta get a baseline measurement of what your brain looks like and then we're gonna start the activity. What we found pretty quickly is that it's impossible to just not think of anything because especially you put someone into a scanner and they're looking around and they're like, oh, this is pretty weird being in a scanner and what's that noise, right? Like, of course you start thinking and it turns out that that area, those areas of the brain, despite the fact that they might not be doing anything, they tend to be active and that is the default mode network. It's highly involved also in attention. So one thing that we we do when we have to like pay close attention to a task is that um, um, when we have to think about it and kind of piece it together and try to figure it out, the default mode network tends to be very active. But once we've got it figured out and once you start doing a task and all you need to do is just be like, okay, I'm like, if, like if you're um, in a factory and you're just, you know, doing a, you got to hammer this, this nail down. And then the next thing comes, you got to hammer the nail down. Well, like you kind of have to pay attention, but you don't really need to think about it. The default mode network activity goes way, 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 way down. And then the really interesting thing about this is that for people who suffer from ADHD, is that the default med network for them just doesn't ever really shut off. So when they're doing those tasks and they got to just sit and focus and do one thing that's kind of boring, their default mode network never shuts off, which is why ADHD patients kind of suffer from like the inability to focus on boring stuff, right? Their mind starts to wander and we know what areas of the brain are involved. And it turns out that it's like these chattering areas of the brain that kind of keep our brain busy. And it's like, so the, it, is that the ghost? No, like these are brain areas. And one of them is like Wernicke's area is part of that. So if that gets damaged, then the whole default mode network is messed up. So. Yeah. So we, we have, you know, my friend who used to be able to, to, to count and do math and right. you know, higher order math and all of that. And now he can't write, he, now he can't say a number. He can write it, but he can't say it. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to remind people of that because the people, they're, they're my own father used to tell me it's a, just a dumb animal. It don't know nothing. And and the word dumb, he, he thought that the animals were just like programmed biological machines, yeah. that they were, they were just programmed to look as if they feel pain and fear, but they don't really feel pain and fear. Right. Yeah. And of course he was an avid hunter. Sure. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, I guess. The, sure. And that's, I mean, of course we have to, uh, you, I mean, at least from what Nate, you know, Darwin described nature and tooth and claw, that there is violence that happens in the animal world. I mean, that's what really defines so much of what animals have to do from the prey's perspective and the predator's perspective. And, and, and biologically, we're kind of stuck in yes, that niche as moral right. as we want to be. Exactly. Yes. But at the so same what, time, right, that thing about pain and emotion and fear, we know what areas of the brain that are involved with in animals because like that's a heavily studied topic in neuroscience and humans have the same areas. So, and, and animals show similar expressions of fear and, and pain um, to, to pretend that like they're not experiencing that is, I mean, that's ludicrous already. Now, whether they have a conscious understanding of it. Much I as I respected, much as right. I respected my dad, I, I had to, I had to take right. strong opposition to him on that point. Yes. Because they definitely so what, what I'd like to explain yeah. to my, my late father and anybody who thinks like him mm -hmm. who might be listening now, I mean, so we, we know that there are people that, you know, you have a stroke and now your brain is damaged and now you can't do the math anymore because you can't think in terms of numbers anymore. You used to be able to think in terms of numbers. So was your soul damaged? Well, you know, your, your spiritual mind can no longer think in numbers. Right. But but what what would happen? How would you think? And I want people to, to think about this when you when you look at an animal, when you look at a dog, you know, and it, it, it amazes me that people think that animals that you have a soul, but your dog doesn't. Right. I mean, if you if you if you if your dog doesn't have a soul, then why should you? <laughs> right. Yes. right. And so and where that line, that dividing line. And this is the thing about consciousness. Um, 
uh, I would argue that humans have a, a, a superior consciousness in many ways, mostly just because of language. I don't think that there's really anything else other than that. Yeah, but, if I may, that's where yeah. I was going to, that mm -hmm. just, uh, just the one question. Yes. How would you think, and I want people to think about this, if you didn't have a language feature, I mean, I've met people who were under the classification that we they used to say back in the century ago what they would call dumb, like my dad would call dumb yeah. animals. They used to That's say right. that about dumb people. That's right. People who have a neurological disorder where they can understand language, but they can't say it. Mm -hmm. You know, like that. I know a guy like this right now. He would hit the, the, the only words he could utter is oh, yeah, yeah. he he mm -hmm. can't actually say a word at right. all. Right. But he can understand the language. So Bearing that in mind, if you don't have the ability to speak, think about how you would think about anything if you don't have an inner monologue to explain right. to yourself what yes. you're doing. Because when we work anything out, right. we're talking to ourselves. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's why how I much think more intelligence. Yep. How much more intelligence does it take to work out anything when you can't yes. describe and, it? And yourself? so it doesn't necessarily require physical speech it obviously helps but uh you know I, there are people who are deaf and many of them cannot speak with their you know their mouth but they speak perfectly with their hands and uh they can have full conversations it's a real language and um and of course obviously they are conscious fully you know realized individuals that have all the ca capacity if not more than myself and you many of them right so uh, but they don't necessarily have to speak, but it's, they still have language. Yeah. And that's the key difference there. Right. So for this individual, like the individuals who suffer from Wernicke's area damage that where they can no longer comprehend speech, this affects their ability to create thoughts. And you can tell by the way that they talk and that they can't understand anything. But for the person who has damage to Broca's area, who had, still has comprehension because they still have a working Wernicke's area. They can't put the words together because now you're getting more to the motor areas of the language system where they can't they can't just find the word correctly or like and I'm sure that there's we don't know all these details, but there's got to be subtlety between writing and speaking as like your friend has suffered from that, that he can write a number out, but he can't say it. Um, this is kind of a common phenomenon with some of these patients because there's going to be some subtle division that occurs because it's different muscle groups that are involved with that. But, um, but the, you know, like there's no question that they are not, you know, they haven't suffered from like lack of consciousness or something, but for someone who's just like completely lost and has this fluent aphasia, it's very, very sad because it's almost as if they are as, I mean, I don't want to disparage anyone and I, I have great sympathy for anyone who has suffers from stroke, but for those particular patients, you could, you could somewhat argue that there's brain damage to the point where they're, I don't want to say brain dead, but but it's the th these are some of the core parts that are key to making sure that that part of what we call consciousness is actually working. And clearly, like there's it's broken and, um, you know, to, but to pretend that somehow a ghost acts on those areas because those areas, they're filled with neurons and we know how they're connected to other neurons and we know the areas that they're connected to. And, you know, you can take, uh, you can take this. So there's a transcranial magnetic stimulation, a device that you can put onto kind of the head of a person and you can change the activity of brain areas. And you can even shut down certain areas of the brain just temporarily, like by, by putting a magnetic pulse across the brain, which will affect neural activity. And you can shut down speech. Like you can just completely block it and disrupt the ability to think. So we can take those areas away and then all of a sudden let it come back. And then all of a sudden you can start thinking again. And, and you can do this for all kinds of different brain areas and cause all kinds of weird effects, affecting vision, affecting the ability to hear. I mean, it's so mechanical and there's no room for, for spirits and ghosts and, and little sprites to jump in there and get between the synapses and start moving things around. I mean, it's just, how does that so work? So let's, let's step outside of humanity mm -hmm. for just a moment. Sure. Um, the parrot next to me is yes. a teenager. Now, when I got him, he knew all the words that he knows now. I haven't been able to get him to learn any new words. Every time I change his water, I say water. And I say water when I take it out. I say water when I put it back. I want him to know that he, you know, this, just say water, that this is what this means. And so I'm expecting that one day that he'll tell me his water's dirty and he'll just say water. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, you know, but he, he knows my name. 
He thinks all food is apple. <laughs> so if he's hungry, he'll say apple. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, food, snack, eat, whatever he thinks it's that normal. means. It's all, it, it that doesn't matter. Food. Yeah. Yeah, but but I, I can't get him to learn anything else. I guess he's let he's already right. beyond that critical learning stage. Yeah, probably you know, from when yes. he, the so, first two years or whatever. Yeah. And I've I've seen some interesting experiments with like Kanzi uh, bonobo, mm -hmm. where chimpanzees and, and uh, bonobos have an incredible memory, much better than ours is actually for um memorizing orders of things so that like they'll they'll flash up a, and this is interesting because especially for people who think that you know that that apes are just animals and therefore don't have any intelligence like people right. when we flash numbers at them and the ape then has to count the number back hitting the symbol and hit the one the two the three the four the five the six right and so they they learn what the order yep. is and they can tell when it's out of order that's right. That's pretty impressive. It's very they, impressive. They don't have the gap in the roof of their mouth that we have mm -hmm. between that. There's a tiny space above our tongue in the roof of the mouth that allows us to make these noise. The same reason that he can talk, this parrot can talk, but other birds in the yard cannot. It's just a slight difference in the inside yep. of the mouth that make that noise. So here's, here's an ape. It's not physically capable of making the kind, and also the, the position of their larynx is different. Larynx. Yep. The very reason that we choke on our food and chimpanzees don't is also the reason we can talk and they can't. Right. Yep. So you talk exactly. about balancing things, right? That's right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and human infants, human infants have their throat in the same position that the, that the, the other apes have theirs. Yep. And then it just shifts. Just put things in perspective. Yes, exactly. So Kanzi the ape can, or the, the bonobo can, can hit, he's got a keyboard system. So he can talk to people, even mm. on the phone. If they yeah. call him on the phone, you can call him on the phone and he can have a conversation with you by hitting the right keys. Now, it's a simple dialogue because it, it, he has a, a key for every word. That's right. So we, we can't do like a Chinese system. There's just no way to right. put in all the words. But he, So he's got a limited dialogue. Right. But my daughter has a dog that also has a keyboard. Mm. Cool. And he tells her when he needs to go out or when yeah. he wants to eat. And he, he hits it on the electric keyboard. Right. So now I'm thinking about the ghost in the dog. Yes, exactly. And one <laughs> great test for this. Okay. So not just that, but you're, you, cause you're absolutely right. Like, you know, there's no, the, this, it's the difference between humans and other animals is one of degree and not kind. And we're only talking about a few things, right? We're talking about language capabilities, uh, consciousness, um, some of the, but I mean, well, I mean, there are only a handful of things, right? Um, and uh, yes, dogs are capable of doing this kind of thing. You can actually get almost any kind of animal to quote unquote communicate by hitting a lever in order to cause something to occur because we're highly driven to get some kind of benefit that will improve our internal state, say getting a treat or having to go outside because I got to take a piss. Um, you can train any animal to hit a lever in order to tell you to do that for the most part. I, I don't want to say any animal. Um, most mammals can do this. Most birds can do this. I would be surprised if you can't find lizards that can do this as well. I'm sure that you can. Um, but this is because animals they have to live in a dynamic environment and they have to have the capacity for learning and knowing that there's a reward that comes from something so that they're going to just do it again right this is just basic sort of classical conditioning paradigm now it does tend to get better with certain kinds of animals with sort of greater cognitive ca capacities such as say bonobos another interesting wrinkle to this is um something that we can call like self-awareness so one thing that we know of, you know, getting back to Descartes to kind of wrap it all back, Descartes knew that he had a body, right? He eventually got to that point. He knew, of course, starting with the mind, but then he also figured out he has a body. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, they had mirrors so he could see the body, right? And that was part of his evidence that there's, that he could see himself in the mirror. And they, he's like, okay, so I have a mind and it's existing and working with this body and I can see my body in the mirror. So not all animals, most animals cannot recognize themselves in the mirror, but there are animals that can. This is known as the mirror recognition test. 
And we know that the great apes, all of them can. When you get to um, the... Uh, some other, dogs, but not yes. other dogs. Yes, not They're all like dogs for some reason, but elephants can. Uh, whales and dolphins can. And then it turns out even some birds can as well. So the corvids can. Uh, there's this great experiment done with magpies where they figured out that they can do this. And so the way they test this is that they they uh, they will like anesthetize an animal, put it to sleep so that um, uh, so that they can put some kind of mark in some place where the animal can't really see it. So like kind of just below the, the neck usually. And then they'll put the animal, wake up the animal and then put them in front of a mirror. And then they look to see, does the animal do mark directed behavior? So if it looks in the mirror and, it, and it's like, like seeing something and it starts touching itself, well, that's evidence that it knows that it's, it can see something like that. So for primates, sometimes they'll do this like on the face someplace and they obviously can't see it unless they see it in the mirror. And so when you put them in front of the mirror, then they'll be like, wow, what is this on my face? Holy cow. Someone, you know, you knocked me out and then you drew like, you know, drunk monkey on here. <laughs> That's classic. Speaking of our 20s. <laughs> that kind of thing, right? No one knows until they look in the mirror. So, but, but animals can do this. So they have self-understanding. They know that they have a body and they can even understand that an image of themselves in a mirror is the reflection of themselves. So, I mean, like, again, it's a degree, it's a, it's a difference of degree and not kind with, as far as humans to other animals. Yeah. And Chris, it just also so, shows like, well, okay, are you going to say chimpanzees, they have spirits then too? Right. I mean, where do we cut that off? Yeah. My argument was, was that if anything alive has a spirit, then everything alive has a spirit. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I, and it may have been progressive at the time, maybe semi-Buddhist. I, I think if I hadn't seen Star Wars before I read the Tao Te Ching, I would have identified as a Taoist. Mm. Yeah. What I would like to do with you is I would like to have a follow-up on this discussion sure. in a, maybe a couple of weeks. I, I, I'm great. doing a conference. I mean, I'm in, uh, I'm in Boston for Satan con this weekend and the next weekend I'll be in Calgary for reason, reason con awesome. and I'm, stupid busy between now and then when i come back from reason con i'll have a minute to breathe cool uh and i'd like to have a follow-up uh, discussion based on the comments challenges that we'll, we'll see in the comments of this video for sure yeah because if there's anything we missed i'm sure there is i think we did pretty good but i'm, I'm sure so somebody good. will come up with something oh i'm sure and i'd like i'd like to have a follow-up based follow on that up. you said that I'm you happy to do that you said you you do debates on this as well. Yes. Well, so I I'm just starting to, and I'm trying to get uh, modern day debates to do a mind body dualism debate, um, which I think would be interesting because I don't know if they've actually touched on that. Yeah. Um, what I typically see is where they keep focusing. They keep bringing back uh, flat it's, Earth guys yes, and I and know. that that kind of thing. So there's. Yeah. I did. I did actually. We can you get like you, this. Aaron. Aaron, you'll like this. I, uh, I know you saw the video with, uh, um, you know, Otangelo and another creationist that I was chatting with on a live stream on my channel, but I, I, I had one of those creationists on because he's also a flat earth creationist. And I really, really wanted to talk about flat earth creationism. And, and I was so glad when this other creationist showed up because he's not a flat earth creationist. So I had a little mini debate of flat earth from a creationist perspective to another creationist perspective and it's so revealing and so interesting and so i actually have another video of that as well like it shouldn't yeah. be to the scientists always defending around earth i think that the young earth creationists who happen to believe in a globe earth they could debate those guys too right why not <laughs> i i've often said that uh the, the lead a guy that i debated i can't remember jaronism something like that mm -hmm. but anyway uh, i always wanted to see that guy up against kent hovind yeah so, so Kent Hoven would be challenged to defend a spherical Earth, and he he'd have to use science to do it. Yes. And so he's he's in a position where he could actually win, and I'm convinced that he would still lose. I'm sure he would because Hoven has no <laughs> fucking clue about science at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will say that the great thing about the young Earth creationist that was defending a globe Earth on my channel was that he was saying like, well, okay, you can't take everything in the Bible literally. 
And I'm like, <laughs> you're a young earth creationist and you're going to say that? <laughs> so funny. Oh, so one of the other things that will come up, and I'm already predicting this, I'm not, I'm not expecting to do this one on the basis of comments in the chat, but one thing that, that often comes up is idealism, uh, yes. where they just want to imagine instead of the mind being any of this, what you know the mind to be, being a neuroscientist, they want to say that they want to get everything upside down. Right. Uh, and they want to say that everything is a product of imagination, that we are just you know figments in the dream of Brahma or something right. like that, which makes me think that think think about I've, I've challenged people on this when, you, when they when they give me this idea I said you know how does how does uh, um, our, our our sense of smell work mm -hmm. yeah. and of course we'll say well well we think it's because of these airborne particles that we're picking up with our olfactory senses or the way that vision works is because of the light spectrum and the way that it reflects off of other things or the way that our our ears work is because of these vibrations through this matrix that then affects these tiny little hairs in our ear, yeah. inner ear and the bones and everything. But all of that is just lies from the creator who wants us to believe that that's how it works because right. everything's entirely imaginary anyway. So there's no such thing as molecules and none of this is real. And so we're just told all of this fake science. Now think of, to apply that to everything you know about how the brain works. Exactly. And just imagine what a phenomenal liar yeah. the God of the idealist must be. be. Yes. All of these labs, thousands, literally thousands of neuroscience labs studying various aspects of how the brain works. It's all just fake. I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable to think about that. And that we can get so granular that we can induce changes in the activity as well, right? Like by altering changes in, in certain behavioral networks and causing behavior, right? You can cause behavior by activating certain networks, but it's all entirely fake. Yes. So right. Darwin recognized the Dunning-Kruger effect mm -hmm. uh, a century and a half early when he, he uttered my favorite quote from him. I'll get part of it when he said that ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. That's beautiful. I've never heard that quote. <laughs> I, I got it right. There's a, there's a little bit more to it, but, but that's yeah. that's that's the part that usually gets quoted. All right. So uh, I hope that yep. in a couple weeks' time we can have a follow up Absolutely. discussion. I would love it. Yes. Enjoy your conferences. All right, Chris Thompson. Yeah. I will I will put links to your channel, and uh, if you have any debates that you would. You, you, like you have a favorite debate you'd like to see? Oh, I'd like sure. to put a link down to that too. That'd be great. Uh, anything that you would like to point people to to see who you are? Oh, sure. And then so, let's see if we can get you on a debate stage. Yeah, I, on this, uh, you know, as far as this forum goes, the best way to kind of see what I'm doing is um, at my YouTube channel. Um, I'm a I'm a neuroscientist, so obviously, like I publish papers and things, and you can look for my papers if you really are interested in that. But you know, for this kind of topic. This is something that I just consider to be a lot of fun that I'm very interested in. I love reading about and debating. My YouTube channel is the best place to find that stuff. And I try to update about once a week. Um, sometimes I just get busy and I can't. Uh, but there's a lot of content that on there already. So, Yeah, and I've been wanting to have this conversation for a while. So yes. I'm glad you, you put up the invitation. I just wanted to throw out another one. So we'll do make sure to do a follow-up in a couple That'd of weeks. That'd be great. I would love that. All right. Dr. Thompson, yes. thank you for being on. Thank you. Shut up. <laughs> Why will this not end? I don't know. Yeah, it says live.